a quick disclaimer that the speakers are speaking in their personal capacity, so they're not uh, representing the opinions or views of the organizations that they are affiliated with. One year ago, we organized our first webinar on this topic of trust in political leadership and democracy in times of crisis. And now we want to look back and see what has actually happened with the trust in our societies since the pandemic started. Um, we know that a certain level of trust is essential for a well-functioning democracy, and our trust has certainly been put to the test during this last year. While there has been a gradual decline in the state of democracy globally over the last few years, 2020 does seem to be the year that has pushed many countries off the edge from democracy to some form of semi-authoritarianism. And today we're going to discuss how trust in political leadership and in democracy has been affected during this year of global crisis. My name is Camila Bocaniala, and I am the co-founder and programs director of Polylogos. I will be moderating this event together with Susan. Dr. Susan Kerr is the senior advisor on freedom of religion or belief at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe's Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. She has over 15 years of European public affairs experience, including from within the European Parliament and the nonprofit sector. And with that, I want to introduce our first two speakers, Heather Nicola Staff. She is the policy advisor on refugee, asylum and migration to members of the UK Parliament. She's a strategic thinker with a passion for international development and cross-cultural work. Uh, she's also a member of the Polylogos Board of Mentors. Welcome, Heather. And we also have Bulchu, Bulchu Funyadi, who is the senior political analyst at Political Capital, a policy research institute based in Budapest in Hungary. Uh, he leads the Institute's research program focusing on radicalization and extremism with a focus on right-wing extremism. His research area includes far-right and populist argumentation, radicalism prevention, and anti-Roma and anti-Semitic sentiments, and much else. Uh, Bulchu studied history, sociology, and international relations, and participated in various scholarships and internship programs. And he has been working with political capital since 2007. So welcome, Bulchu, and welcome, Heather. Um, I want to start by asking a question to you, Heather. And I want to ask if you can tell us, just to open this conversation a little bit, what do we actually mean by trust and integrity in leadership? And do these concepts still matter? Please, Heather. Thanks, Camilla. Um, and classically, like uh, every politician, good to kind of avoid the question, but also answer a question with a question in terms of, do any of us really know what we mean when we ask or talk about trust um, and integrity? Um, I actually want to start with recalling um, a journey on a, a tube train I took the other day. Um, so as I was sitting on the tube, I saw this guy and in my own mind, I'd already made up what I thought about him. He looked like someone that just got out of prison. He had tattoos. He wasn't wearing a face mask. In fact, he was twirling the face mask around and I was sitting there sweating because I thought, my goodness me, what's this guy doing? And so I had made up my mind. He's not a good person. Uh, I can't trust him. He ignores the rules. You know, all these things just blatantly, you know, judging this poor person. Now. We got halfway along my journey and suddenly a, a member came over like a, a woman with a carrying a child and she needed a seat nobody got up including myself i want to put out that this guy immediately gets up and says please take my seat and she's saying no no i don't need he says please take the seat so she takes the seat he goes and moves down the seat you know and i'm like huh interesting okay and then another family gets on with a little boy who is scared about the tube train and the noise. And he starts calming the little kid down and says, take my seat. And he gets up again when nobody else had. And he had the most beaming smile, the most beautiful smile on his face and compassion and concern. And I sat there feeling thoroughly chastised about my judgment, my kind of reading a, a book by its cover as it were, rather than the heart of this person in almost what, five seconds on the tube journey, I'd gone from not trusting somebody to suddenly thinking, wow, this guy has something about him. 
And how often does that happen in public life as well? Something shapes our decision in a spur of a moment, whether somebody has integrity or whether somebody has trust. So trust, can I count on somebody? Is there a political trust? What about confidence in the actual institutions around me? Do I trust the police anymore after hearing something bad? Do I trust the authority of parliament when it doesn't necessarily do the thing I want it to do? And what about integrity? Is integrity just a checklist of what I do and do not? Is it a personal matter of acting accordingly to moral standards? Or is it something different? Is it about somebody who has a firm understanding of conviction and a resolve to stand by that conviction, even under difficulty and pressure? Now in the UK, we've had lots of issues around this, particularly around standards in public life. You know, are people in public life really adhering to the obligation to not act inappropriately under influence or financial gain? Again, is it just a checklist or do we want something more out of that? And does it really matter? Because when somebody is found to have done something wrong or taken financial gain, is it really playing out in an election result a couple of weeks down the line? And the question I always get asked about being in politics, and it's the one that tends to drive me mad, Camilla, is when people say, you know, all politicians are the same. Everybody's the same. Everybody's dirty. Everybody's corrupt. And we had the expenses scandal uh, many years ago, actually, in the UK. And that had a real dip in public confidence. But interestingly, it was some MPs that were seen as being lower in confidence on trust. Some, it was, oh, well, you know, they had to do that. Whereas now we enter a time, is that still there? Do we really view people the same way? Are there answers or, or things that come across in a sense where we simply say, yes, but it's a pandemic or well, it's a war. So of course they had to act like that. Or well, you know, it's a really difficult situation. Um, do we have grace for people? And again, going back to that tube journey, the way somebody looks, the way they dress, we often say that being a female in politics is particularly hard for people to maybe trust you or look at how you are in terms of competency. Trust and competency, maybe we confuse them slightly and the same with integrity. Is it about what we do as well? Um, and so that's kind of where I'm at, Camilla, in the sense that there are more questions than answers to this, I think. That's very true, Heather, and I actually have uh, a lot more questions for you, and I would actually follow it up directly with another question, um, because you mentioned that people will often excuse the behavior of their leaders because there is a crisis. We need to, we need to say, oh, it's okay, because they're under so much pressure, because we need them to protect us. Um, and my question is, when a crisis hits, are we perhaps more comfortable mm. with authoritarianism than maybe we like to think? What I mean is, are we happy as long as we are safe? Or do we still care about democratic rights and freedoms? Yeah, that's such a good question. And I think sometimes within that, we have to look also and be quite honest that trust can be manipulated. And also, purposely misleading or undermining processes. So normalized behavior in that situation as well, where somebody can literally say, you know, on the doorstep you might hear, I expected it of them. And then they may say, well, I have to do this. And it goes further. So I work in, in refugee and migration policy. Um, and where we're at at times is this situation where somebody might say, you know, it's okay that I violate international law? What does that mean to me, anything? Because, you know, I'm going to keep people safe. We have to be tough. We have to close our borders. You know, uh, the International Convention on Rights and Refugees, it doesn't mean anything anymore because we need to have safe borders. It's for the greater good. But Max Weber actually said, uh, he's a political thinker. He said, there is no more pernicious distortion of political energy than the worship of power for its own sake. And I think sometimes we can worship that power, whether it looks good or dresses good or, or simply comes out with, okay, yeah, I bent the rules here and I bent the rules there, but it was for your good. You know, it, I'm being tough in this situation. 
there's a protest going on there. Okay, yes, you want to go there, but actually you can't. You can't do that because we need to protect you and we need to keep you safe. And those erosion of rights start to creep in. And I know others will talk a bit more on this, but I do think there is a tendency sometimes where we drift into letting somebody who sounds good, who dresses well perhaps, or who's quite charismatic or speaks the way I want them to hear, they say something I like. And then perhaps they get away with it, drip by drip by drip, because we don't think that they possibly could do us any harm, or perhaps we do, but we expect it of them again. And the question I would always ask in those circumstances is what is it that actually someone has set out to achieve? What is it with their conviction? And if you'll allow me, Camilla, I just wanted to um, reference a poem. Um, it's quite a funny poem, but it's about leadership. And it says, it's the true leadership treasure. So I'll just read the first two verses really. And it said, I went on search to be a leader, searching high and low above the meter. I spoke with authority that I remember. All would follow, all but one member. Why should I trust you? The one did ask. What have you done to achieve the task? And I think that is crucial. Is somebody achieving that task or is it just a figment of our imagination? Are they talking a good talk? What is it that we want from our leaders? Do we want that tough kind of macho leader in a way, the kind of this is the rules that you're going to follow? Or do we want someone that can both exhibit compassion and what we think is integrity in that situation who might have to make strategic decisions as they go along? A few of the other speakers are also gonna to touch on this. What do we look for in a leader? Um, what, what are we looking for uh, when we choose our leaders, um, which can be different in crisis versus normal times? Um, Bulchu, I have a question for you. What do you think are some factors that have influenced the levels of trust in our societies in recent years in general? And how does it affect our democracies or put in another way, why does it even matter? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, yeah, so maybe I would start with uh, looking at a bit on uh, poll results um, concerning trust. Um, and if you look at the poll results, we could see that uh, some polls show that uh, during the first wave of the pandemic, um, trust in authorities, especially national authorities, um, rose. However, however, during the second wave of the, of the pandemic, um, the trust has decreased in authorities and also in, in media uh, and also interpersonal trust. Um, for instance, Eurobarometer and, and some other polls um, have shown this. So that was an interesting um, kind of change um, how trust uh, developed or evolved between the, the two waves of the pandemic. Um, and I was interested in how like trust um, changed in, in, in recent times, in decades. I had to put uh, the change of trust during the pandemic in a bit of context. And I've seen, we've done a, a major research in, in 2015 on, on trust within Europe. Um, and I saw that, um, that there is a kind of gradual uh, decline of trust, um, which has been going on for decades actually in Europe. Um, and we could see, or we can see that, uh, like for instance, the pro proportion of those who tend to trust national parliaments has decreased in all of the EU member states, in the old EU member states um, in the last two or three decades. So it's, it's actually been going on um, for, for a longer time. And of course, after the economic crisis 28, 29, we could see a sharp decline um, of trust in, in most of the countries, and especially, of course, in those countries that was that were um, hit uh, hardest uh, by, um, by that uh, crisis. Um, and I think in terms of the pandemic, uh, it's important that we're speaking about the crisis-like situation. So an unusual and unprecedented, almost unprecedented situation. And, and, and I think many um, may have the impression nowadays that such kind of situation um, uh, have become more frequent and probably also like their numbers have increased. If you think of like, for instance, the, the, the geopolitical crises like um, the Crimean crisis or the war in Donbass or like um, the crisis in the Middle East. Um, but if we can also think of the economic crisis, which I just mentioned, or like the whole issue of global warming 
Um, we had 2015 um, migration um, situation, some called migration crisis. So there are a lot of um, situation. There have been a lot of situation, um, I think, in recent years, decade, uh, which not only affected our lives, but also which had um, a very significant impact um, on, on the outlook of people or, or on the vision of people, how they look the into the future, what they expect from the future. Um, and to close, uh, also I looked at the social demographic indicators, which um, explain trust or which of which we think that they would explain trust in general. And I, get, I could see that the socio, socio demographic indicators actually hardly explain trust. It's probably the only, only one factor uh, which has an impact um, on trust is the level of education. So um, the higher um, the education, um, the higher the, the trust in authorities and also in, in the interpersonal trust. But I think um, what is more important um, than the social demographic indicators and also the education um, are the subjective and the objection of the, the feeling of, um, of, of how um, well I am or, or um, and also like how satisfied I am with life and also um, the objective well-being of my living standard. So the more satisfied I'm, uh, I am with life and the more or the higher living stand standards I have, the more I tend to trust or the more trust I tend to have. Um, and also another factor which, uh, which impacts uh, actually the level of trust is the social embeddedness. So the, 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 the broader social network um, I am embedded in and the more support and the more help I get, for, for instance, from my, from my fellow citizens, from my neighbors, from my, from my family, um, the more trust I tend to have in, in other individuals. That is uh, quite logical, if you think about it, that you will have more trust if you, if you have better social connections and you're more um, in a better place socially. In your opinion, what are some factors that have affected our level of trust in each other and in our leaders and maybe even in democracy as an institution during this pandemic? I think it's very important here, but I, also, but I mentioned before that uh, this pandemic um, is probably the first time since the, since the Second World War um, that um, every dimension of my life um, has been such, has been affected such, uh, that significantly and negatively on a global scale. So probably like uh, most, of, um, most of the human beings um, on the earth have, um, have, um, have been very much affected from, from the last uh, one and a half, two years. Um, and all of the dim dimensions of our life, like the private life, our social life, um, our health, of course, um, also our work situation, our financial um, 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 possibilities, but also our public life. So in terms of each dimensions, it, it was a very, for, for most of us, I think it was a very negative uh, time, um, this pandemic. Um, and I think what has like uncertainty and insecurity has, or have been probably the kind of the two main um, feelings that most of us um, have had in, in, in the last couple of um, years. And this is probably kind of an answer to question Heather raised, like what are we expecting from our leaders? And I think in times of such crisis, like uh, this pandemic, I think certainty and security have become the most important um, goals of people or the most valuable goods um, that people can think of nowadays. And that I think uh, very much affects like um, how we see or what we expect from politicians and also um, how we trust our politicians or which politicians or which, which authorities we trust the most nowadays. Um, I think which was also very important is that during the pandemic, I think we have kind of lost our compasses or lighthouses, like all the kind of authorities which we tend to believe in like science, um, national authorities or international authorities or, or media outlets, um, they actually were all in the same um, struggle. They all looked for answers and, and any of them could provide us with the objective truth because we knew so little 
um, of the pandemic. So there were so many questions because there was the, the virus was 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 very new thing. We, we didn't know about um, almost anything about the origin of the virus, about the basic characteristics of the virus, how it spread, uh, what the symptoms are, and so on and so forth. So it was a it's, it was a very new situation to all of us, and there were hardly any any actors who could kind of show us like show citizens the direction uh, where we where we should um, where we should go it, it was like uh, probably for many of of us it was a feeling um, um, of an of a social experiment where where different governments tried different things and um, and wanted to see which works better which works um, less um, and also I think it was important that it was a very um, fast changing situation like information changed sometimes from from one day to another day there were new findings um, coming up uh, which might be or might have been contradictory to to findings from yesterday so it, so the whole situation was very unstable um, I think a, a good example is is the news um, um, from um, from the other day that um, um, the new US president um, raised um, um, the question again where the virus actually originated from, where, whether it developed naturally or, or it leaked from a Chinese lab. Uh, and we can remember that um, um, a year ago, approximately a year ago, this, was, this question was answered that the virus developed naturally and also Facebook kind of banned from that on Facebook banned all the news which um, which um, 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 said that that it kind of spread from a Chinese lab and now Facebook um, um, announced that it again would allow all kind of news which uh, which say that, that the virus um, originated from a, from a lab. Um, so I think it's it's really a good example to show how unstable the whole situation is and how information has changed um, from one day to another very quickly. Um, and it's I think it's also um, raised serious questions um, about the role and responsibility of the mainstream media. Um, there were a lot of situation um, where I think also we as um, readers, but also um, uh, media workers could ask or think of um, where are the boundaries between providing information, creating confusion, or even creating hysteria. Like if, if, it, if the information changes so rapidly and there are contradicting information from one day to another, you can ask yourself as a media worker, what actually should you publish? What, for what information should you give publicity? Um, and this leads to my I think last point is the role of disinformation. Uh, during the pandemic, we have seen a huge wave of disinformation, um, especially, of course, on social media channels. Um, and a, a big chunk of this disinformation was intentionally spread by states, for instance, or by politicians, political actors, but also by, by um, opportunist business actors who just wanted to, to earn more money. Uh, with the pandemic, but also uh, um, a lot of information, false information was spread unintentionally by, by people um, who wanted to spread information in goodwill, but uh, this might have turned out to be uh, false information. Um, and, and this pandemic showed that um, false information, disinformation poses a serious risk not only, of course, to trust, but also to, to health issues. So, for instance, who rejects vaccination or who doesn't believe in, 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 in the coronavirus um, may suffer um, serious illness or, or, or it may even um, 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 yeah, be dead. Um, and I, I refer to the Globsec Trends 2020 data, which was conducted in 2029. Um, CE countries and Western Balkan countries, um, and the uh, and the poll showed that um, one third of the citizens of these nine countries believe in conspiracy theories related to the COVID nineteen. So it's a actually it's it's a significant amount of people who believe in conspiracy theories related to the virus, and and the risk of of believing con conspiracy theories related to the 
coronavirus is that this kind of conspiracy theories might open the door for, for other conspiracy theories. And once you are kind of falling in the trap of conspiracy theories, um, it's very hard to dismantle or debunk these conspiracy theories. Um, so actually the, the, the task is to prevent these conspiracy theories um, to, to spread or prevent people to believe in conspiracy theories and debunk these theories before they, um, they spread. Thank you ever so much. Um, so I heard from you, of course, the point about it having felt a bit like a social experiment, uh, not quite sure what was coming next. Sometimes um, you raise points of fake news, disinformation, conspiracy theories, this idea of a mental trap. Once you enter into a conspiracy theory, you're more susceptible maybe to others. And of course, it's not conducive to trust. You also raised the role of the media and social media in this, which of course are two very important <laughs> points as well. Um, I'd like now though to introduce two further panelists. Um, delighted to introduce Yasmin Hasic. He currently serves as the Executive Director of Humanity in Action, Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is an international nonprofit focused on minority and human rights, minority issues and human rights. He holds a PhD in political science from the ULB, Université Libre de Bruxelles, and from Luis Guido Cali of Rome. His research interests revolve around diaspora studies and demographic changes associated with post-conflict migration, along with peace building and transitional justice in multicultural societies. He's worked as a research analyst at the Center for Security Studies in Sarajevo, as well as at the European Parliament and the Bosnian Embassy in Brussels. A native of Sarajevo, he's participated in several intensive international leadership programs overseas. And he's also an alumni of the British Bosnian Fellowship in London and the Diplomacy and Diversity Fellowship in Washington, DC and Paris. And I'll also introduce Christelle Lamen Yambi, who is an author, lecturer and teacher based in Dusseldorf, Germany and Brussels, Belgium. He's trained as a political scientist and has worked 12 years as an analyst and then as a representative to the EU for an international Protestant association in the fields of human rights, poverty, migration and the environment. A diversity of fields have led him to these intersection of themes of ideas, convictions, social issues, political issues and existential questions. Today, Christelle offers his services as a consultant in strategic and political communication. In 2019, he contributed three chapters in the book Is God a Populist, which I edited, <laughs> published in Norway, and it's now free of charge online and as an ebook. So I'll start with uh, Yasmin. Yasmin, just building actually on some of the questions that we had before we heard um, from Heather, actually, her closing question was really about trust, you know, in, in leaders. Um, do we really, do we want maybe these macho leaders or not? What type of leaders are we looking for? What traits are we after? And so I'd like to ask you, what is the disconnect between leadership traits people or voters tend to appreciate before general elections, um, party promises, affiliations, etc., as compared to the traits they look for in global crisis management, when they expect immediate results and competencies from people who often were not voted into office based on these, these traits? Yes, maybe. Susan, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Thank you to all my colleagues for being here and everybody else following us. Well, this is a tale as old as time, I guess. People struggle for power and there is a malfunction in the system and something happens. So, um, in our case, let's call it the Bosnian case, but it can be extrapolated to any any, any other political system. Uh, we usually go out and vote for people who are uh, celebratory ethnic warriors who promise you this or that, uh, who will not raise your wages necessarily or improve your lifestyle in the country, but they will make you a proud X, Y, Z, fighting for your national rights within the multi-confessional state. And this is the, the ticket they have been writing for years and years and years and years. And 2018 elections happened in our country and there was this malfunction called COVID-19 that happened in 2020. So all the people that were elected for many, many years, including 2018, for all this of uh, populocracies and, and, and all these uh, ethnic warriors that somehow 
shown themselves as, as true leaders of whatever they are, um, suddenly failed the test, right? They didn't know what to do. They didn't play the same cards. The games changed. The players have changed. The, the circumstances are completely different. Um, so what emerged from this party and political system uh, malfunction, I would call it this way, it's a structural uh, leadership fragility, right? So as you have state fragility, this is a leadership fragility because people tend to be very strong in winning tickets um, um, in one, two, three, five different areas and fields, but none of us, both the voters and the people who run for votes are ready to manage crisis uh, as such. So if you have this structural leadership fragility combined with this COVID-19 vaccine diplomacy and every other uh, possible developments that have, you know, unfolded in the past 18 months, then you have a strong state capture because guess what? People who are voted in the office will not resign because they are incompetent in managing the crisis now. So what happens then is that they pretend that they can do it well. And because there is no le legal framework for them to work and operate in crisis or how to manage their powers and so on and so forth, they tend to sort of group themselves, which opens up you know, spaces for corruption, for networks that are illicit, for other types of cooperation. You guess what I'm going to say. And then what happens as a consequence of this, the opposition falls down because they're being silenced. Every time they say something, look, there's a corruption case here because this prime minister paid this much money for a respirator or a bottle of a vaccine, or he didn't manage to do this and this, the opposition gets silenced because everybody says, look, you're not here to criticize, it's the pandemic, so they can do whatever they want. So there you have the second consequence. And the third one, which is the most unfortunate one, is that the big players like the EU, like the big players who can actually provide certain vaccines at this point, it could be anything else, any incentive we can think of, are only talking to the government people because this is a state to state interaction. So this legitimizes them externally even more which brings us to complete system failure, which, which started with a small malfunction, which started in 2018 in my country, when we went out and we voted in people who are not able to manage what suddenly happened to us. And nobody, not even now, is thinking about factoring this in into the next elections. What if another crisis reemerges? It doesn't have to be a virus. It can be economic, it can be security, it can be anything else. It's just simply something that we don't factor in when we go out and vote. And this malfunction produces leaders that are not fit to govern in the crisis period. And during the crisis period, they're reinforced by themselves because they don't want to resign. The opposition gets silenced and all the other external uh, action and factors are legitimizing their position which is terrible. This is a complete system meltdown. Thank you very much. Um, COVID has malfunction, leadership fragility, incompetence, corruption, opposition, but failing to, to be able to get their voice out there because it's a systemic failure. And I wonder then, just based on what you were saying, which factors do you think actually motivate political leaders in deciding how they should handle these types of crises? And what other factors should good leaders consider? It's not always about them. I think this is a good question. I, I think that there's there should be somebody writing about this or a book or something. There should be a, a playbook on leaders and how to manage this, this, this playful whatever crisis that we're under. However, I think the emphasis beside the leaders should also be on the voters. Um, leaders and voters should both know what the institutions are capable and how they operate even in the crisis period, which they don't know. Voters and leaders should know what the public contestation fields are, because some people are fighting for the public health, some are fighting at the same time for anti-corruption, some are fighting for the rule of law, some are fighting for the personal freedoms, I can't get out because it's pandemic, there's a martial clock and so on and so forth, so it's becoming contestations of different fields is becoming um, diverse and nobody knows what they're fighting for. Um, on top of this, I think that we should have uh, alternative sources of, of power. 
there should be some pressure. There should be some way of getting people voted out of the office, which in my country doesn't exist. It can only happen during the election time. We have no extraordinary elections. We have no external pressure that would benefit anybody in from, from making the point that they want to make when the democracy is in crisis or anything else. And then I think that the last one, but probably the most one, we should have performance-oriented demand, which is followed by performance-supported requests of the politicians and the leaders that actually are capable of listening and readapting their political narratives and the discourses to what is actually happening, rather than anticipating what they think might benefit them for um, the period when the crisis is over or when it ends in the near future. So I don't know if this answers completely the question, but I think there are traits that need to be taken into account more so on the voters' side and less so on the leaders' side because they are the ones who are adapting and serving the public and not the vice versa. Thank you very much. I mean, I completely agree that civil society plays a very fundamental role in any, in any, democratic, uh, in any democratic society. And I think what you mentioned about the raising alternative sources of power is of course very important, external pressure um, and leaders being able to, to see what they need to do to respond to the here and now, <laughs> and not a lot of hypotheticals. Um, I'll move on quickly then to Christelle, just so we have time for some Q&A at the end. Um, Christelle, I'd like to ask you, do you think we have trust wrong? Returning to trust, do you think we have trust wrong? Can we look at trust through a different lens perhaps? And can society actually function without it? What do you think? Thank you very much, Susan. Um, I believe that question is interesting because often the comments we, we hear about the, uh, the crisis of trust we have in our democracy tend to um, argue something like we are losing trust and trust is disappearing uh, from our societies. And I, I'd like to challenge that idea a little bit around um, what I believe, uh, the, the phenomenon which I believe we are observing, which is that trust is currently in tension. Um, a little bit like a, a piece of fabric the two sides are trying to uh, um, to take from themselves uh, uh, from each other and um, uh, uh, this begins with the observation that human beings are uh, social animals we live in societies and we cannot function without trust uh, now of course at an individual level or at certain times of crisis personal crisis uh, or societal uh, crisis there can be varying total levels of trust but i i do not think that a society can function without trust the thing is that um since the uh emergence of uh, liberal democracies in the 18th and uh, 19th centuries we have been used to the concept, the idea of the nation state uh, and that the leadership of the nation state, uh, the, 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 the government of the nation state should gather the trust of the population. And of course, that is essential. Um, the thing is, however, that as human beings, we tend to trust multiple communities, individuals. And uh, what I believe we're observing now is what uh, Ulrich Berg, uh, the, the German sociologist in uh, the Society uh, of, of Risk um, in, in the 80s has, has called the, um, the, 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 the great move of trust to, to the sub-political realms. I think what we're observing is that levels of trust are um, changing ownership and that instead of a, a the, the general trust that the, the, the people should have to, uh, to, towards political leaders now, um, people tend to trust other forms of authority. So society continues to function with trust, but our references tend to multiply, to be uh, diffracted. Uh, and, and then that, uh, as a consequence, uh, uh, provokes a form of fragmentation, social fragmentation. We have different sources of authority when it comes to media consumption, uh, different sources of authority when it co comes to belief systems. Um, and, and trust is, is uh, leaving one camp, uh, the traditional camp, which is the uh, uh, traditional leadership of, uh, of our, our modern democracies and, and moving to, to other spheres. And we are a bit lost 
because uh, societies have not functioned that way, especially in the West, uh, for a very long time. Um, now, before liberal democracies in the in the Middle Ages, you know, populations in Europe were used to having, to having multiple levels of authority and trust, and we do not know how to function in such a situation. I, I think it will probably take um, a long time for us to figure out how um, how it is possible nowadays to, to, to function with conflicting and uh, different levels of trust. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a very interesting point that you raised about the different levels of trust, also um, different forms of trust that we, that we can um, form in society, not just vis-a-vis -vis the traditional authorities, but also with other forms of authority um, with other, other actors um, in, in society. Um, I'd like to pose a follow-up question. Um, how do you see the link between the lack of trust and the current phenomena such as uh, that, that are you know current, current phenomena that are occurring such as the rise of populism um, and um, and maybe you could also link to the pandemic in that mm. Yes, thank you. I think um, uh, what well, one of the basic rules at, at, in times of crisis, you know, uh, the, the, the playbook of crisis management. Number one is stick to the facts, you know, find out what the facts are and communicate uh, to, to, to the people what the facts are. And in this pandemic, I think, and, and several of us have, have uh, mentioned that, we have been faced uh, uh, to a situation where even our leaders had a hard time figuring out what the facts were. And in such a situation as a leader, um, your choice is either to uh, create a story that you will tell um, to make sure that the people's response, the population's response is what you expect from them, or um, simply face the truth that you do not know exactly what the facts are. And um, unfortunately, a lot of what I have observed over the, the past year and year and a half um, is that uh, the, the um, in many countries, the population reacts as if um, they were told a story that they do not believe. Uh, and I must say I'm very worried uh, for uh, the consequences in the, in, in the midterm of, uh, uh, of, of, of this perception that, uh, that the, the stories that have been told are not truthful. And, and, you know, true speech and truth telling is one of the, 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 the essential pillars of trust. You know, you trust someone when, you know, the way they speak to you, the things they describe corresponds to the reality you can observe yourself. Uh, if you perceive that what they're telling you does not correspond to the reality you, you perceive yourself, then you tend not to trust them. Another pillar of trust is integrity, and that's been mentioned by um, several several of us or, already. And um, in, integrity is, um, uh, in a way, is, is an effort to do what is best for everyone at every moment, and including things that uh, will not be popular for ourselves if we are leaders. Uh, I, I remember um, about six weeks ago, in the space of one week. There were two crises in, in Germany and in France. Uh, in Germany, Angela Merkel made uh, decisions about how to manage the pandemic uh, and entered in the tension with uh, the leadership of the, of the landers, so the, the, the regions of, of Germany. And two days later had to um, make public apology, like literally an apology, uh, assuming her responsibility and the fact that she was wrong in what she had done. In that very same week, maybe one day later, it might have been the Thursday, the day, the day later, President uh, Emmanuel Macron was interviewed uh, at a press conference, and he was also under fire for um, certain decisions that he'd made and scenes which, uh, things which seemed to have been mistakes in, in terms of decision making. And the journalists were asking him, do you think you should apologize for what you've done? And he literally said, uh, in French, il n'y a pas de mea culpa à faire. There, there is no, um, uh, 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 no apology to be made. But the phrase mea culpa in Latin is taken from the Catholic liturgy. You know, that's when you confess your, your sins, you know, and you, and you pray saying, this is my fault. 
Uh, and that's quite interesting that in the space of, of, of one week, you see two leaders going in two different directions. Um, that's what, where I, I, I believe the population sees integrity uh, and, and thinks about um, whether they, they believe they can trust their leaders or not. These defining moments, should I do something which may be unpopular, may be uh, negative for, for, for me, or should I not? Um, the, the, the growth and the rise of populism, I believe, uh, is that's really the fuel of populism. That, that's the, the not um, in, in, you know, in classical uh, um, political theory, you have this concept of the general will, that the democracy follows the general will. And this is based on the idea that every citizen, every person in society is meant to wish the best thing for the entirety of society as well as uh, as well as themselves. What I'm observing is that we're moving from um, an exception of a general will, which needs to be expressed, to general unwill. Uh, the, the, the idea that um, actually our decision makers are suspicious and that uh, our, our, our structures of authority may not mean the best for us as a society. That is really worrying, and um, and I believe uh, that um, the role of civil society, of you know, um, as I explained earlier, the multiple levels of trust, um, we need to uh, to to we stop and try and figure out how we can rebuild that trust in 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 that basic idea that in in a society. We need to look for the best, the best for the entirety of society as well as ourselves. Reestablish this concept of the positive general will of the common good in another language. Thank you very much. I think you raised a number of very interesting points there. Um, you know, from what has been said before about leaders struggling maybe to find out the facts at the beginning, um, and then to formulate their own stories. I think this is a very interesting point. The narratives that are put across. Um, I was thinking actually about the is Israeli historian Yuval Noah Harari and what he talks about, you know, this idea of, you know, people not belong, not believing in the stories that they were told over the previous decades and that that is a big factor um, in the lack of trust and actually the rise of populism as well, as you then went on to discuss. Um, this point you raised about integrity, of course, is crucial if you don't believe that political leaders have integrity, <laughs> if they can't admit when they're wrong. Um, then of course you're you're less likely to believe them. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, so I think I've, I've spotted in the the, uh, the chat box there are a couple of questions, um, and I will start with the top one, which is by Jack. Jack asks: In any democracy, there are always losers in the election. Are losers less likely to accept decisions and decision makers as being trustworthy? Um, I will hand that over to whoever would like to answer it, actually, of the speakers. Please feel free. I think it, it depends on how the decision was achieved. I think I think you can accept a decision, and rightly so, in a democracy when you know and trust that it is a fair and free election. And I think there's a difference between considering the decision maker who's been elected in as trustworthy off the back of an election. I think I'll I'm going to get into trouble for saying this, but what I'd say is the job of the opposition is almost to make the other seem untrustworthy at times. <laughs> and in fact, I would pretty much always say that my opposition is untrustworthy. That's why I'm in the opposition. So <laughs> there is that. However, you can still find common ground with saying that. And you can absolutely say that the person opposite me who has won this election has integrity. You know, whether I believe in their policies is a very different matter, but their character, I can say absolutely, I, I trust them um, and I trust the democratic process to get me there. When that democratic process is under question, I think that's a very different conversation where it's very clear there has been some meddling or corruption or even where you might be thinking in your own head, were the facts and the information given to people correct? Were people told a lie in order to get to this decision? what happened during this process even then I'd still say actually you know I've been <laughs> I hate to say but being I'm in the opposition party in the UK so I'm quite used to losing um so <laughs> I'd like to win some point but I'm quite used to losing it is hard to take it it's hard to accept 
but you have to. And that is why there is still trust in a process because that also builds trust. If I accept that, that process was free and fair, and then we move forward from that. But I do, I do think it's a slightly different question where that process was under intense scrutiny and there are questions about it. We have a very interesting question from Simona. And she asks, basically she asks, how can you stop conspiracy theories without affecting freedom of speech and expression of opinions? And linked with that, who would have the authority to decide what is a conspiracy theory and what is not? And I think several of you uh, would maybe want to answer this question, but I think I'll direct it towards maybe Bulch or Christelle or both of you. Uh, there are more conspiracy theories <laughs> than anyone can tackle, I believe. Um, uh, and ultimately, I believe that the, the authority to decide which is a conspiracy theory or not is the individual it's up to you now this does not exhaust the problem uh there's um, a a quote from um a writer named jonathan swift in the, the early 18th uh, century a writer said uh falsehood flies and the truth comes limping after it it's always so so hard to um, try to establish that something is false when, um, when people are already inclined to believe a message which, which is false. Um, and uh, my, I try to do that, you know, because I do like, I'm sure all of you do, I do have people around me uh, who are sensitive to some of the narratives that are put out there, which to me sometimes sound ludicrous uh, uh, and I think I'm more interested in understanding why they tend to believe such or such narrative. Um, I found that many people who uh, whom we could say believe uh, conspiracy theories are generally not as convinced as we may believe they are of, uh, of their narratives uh, but um, uh, often what happens is a desire to know the truth, um, to, um, to be empowered. And, uh, and that actually is a much more interesting conversation. Now, it is true that this has real life implications, right? It leads to people not respecting you know, public health uh, mandates or not, um, uh, not getting vaccinated or, or, or things of that sort, but ultimately, the individual is sovereign and, and, and we cannot force people to do things that, that are against their will. And I, I, I believe uh, that uh, freedom of speech is a, is a value we need, we need to uphold. Um, as much as I dislike, you know, seeing certain stories or, or, or messages online or repeated by people around me, messages should be out there and um, they should be there in the open and um, because they they're all the more open to criticism and and then ultimately people can make up their own minds uh, because otherwise we I mean it's like fighting fire with fire you know sometimes it works but generally it doesn't thank you Christelle um, Bulcho did you want to say something on this or um, probably just something very briefly. I generally completely agree with Christoph. Um, and I also think, and that's, um, I think I also mentioned it in my talk that I think actually prevention is, is the most important thing um, when we try to tackle um, or combat conspiracy theories and also combat fake news actually. But I think there is a clear limitation to freedom of speech also in terms of conspiracy theories and, and fake news and so on and so forth which is the, the threat to, 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 to citizens. Oh, yeah. And we have seen uh, in, in some cases in the US and also in, in some European countries when conspiracy theories ignited physical attacks on people, on communities. Um, and that's, I think that's a clear, clear red line. Um, and there, I think authorities um, should, um, should be involved. Um, but of course you have the whole question of how to um, regulate social media, which uh, I don't want to go into this question because that's a, that's a huge one. Um, 
but I think there are um, legit, uh, legitimate um, solu- yeah, options or, or, or at least the will is legitimate to that we have somehow to, to regulate this fear because um, there are serious risks um, related to this. Such a good point from both of you. Um, thank you. I'm aware of the time, but Susan, I think we have one more question. We have time for one more question, don't you think? I think so, because we started a couple of minutes late. <laughs> so, um, and this one actually really has Yasmin's name on it, I think. Um, so Yasmin, I'm going to pose this to you. It's, um, it's from Jack. Is adaptability in policy an attractive election offer? Or do voters prefer fixed viewpoints that are clear? I'm, I'm going to start with a cl- cliche. We can't generalize, da, da, da. but in the countries that we are talking or living in, I'm talking from my own perspective, as Camilla at the beginning said, we're all here in private capacity or talking from the countries that we operate in. I think that in my country, um, the, the what I said earlier, democracy plus populism equals populocracy, right? So it's this is that we love celebrity uh, leaders. We love uh, ethnic warriors that have been there for 20 years. We trust them because they're there and we grew up with them. It's like watching friends and then you love Ross and Rachel and it's 10 seasons later. So it translates into politics the same way. Um, however, the issue here is that do they do we prefer consistency? Yes. Do we prefer adaptability? I don't know because no one has ever shown us that we can switch channels and not follow the same show for uh, for so many years. But I also believe that uh, so nobody has shown us the alternatives. And the second thing is that our voters tend to believe what people who have been so long in power tend to say to them: "This is important for you." I'm the one who's going to keep this country a whole. I'm the, I'm the one who's going to tear this country apart. I'm this guy who's going to take a chunk of the country and make us independent and so on and so forth. So whatever the um, you know discourse is, people tend to believe that this is the right thing. These are the guys who defend their real interests and not the guys who actually defend their real interests, which is public health, their own health, health of their children and so on and so forth. So. Um, I would consider and urge the voters, those who are watching and everybody else, just to consider to factor in some, some managerial skills and experiences and adaptability next time they go out and vote for somebody else. We are all sick of friends and the politics that we've been seeing for, for so many years. So not, no offense to friends, but that's, that's the point. Thank you. Thank you. Camilla? Thank you so much, Yasmin. And thank you to all of you. I promised one hour and one hour it is. So I just want to say a big thank you to each of you. Um, You contributed with some very important points and also to the participants for all your questions. Um, Love your curiosity and uh, just your reflections on this. And let's keep this conversation going. Let's uh, not leave it here, but let's keep being uh, alert and curious and keep protecting our democracies and our freedoms and our rights and everything else that we love.